Hi everyone, I'm John Fenzel. We're here right off of Utah Beach, the site of the Breakwater Manor assault on June 6, 1944. This is often cited as a classic example of small unit tactics and leadership overcoming a larger force. The famous attack by EZ Company on the German artillery guns right here at this location was immortalized in the series Band of Brothers. Now, Breakwater Manor isn't an easy place to find, but once you're here, you can feel that something is unique. Something is definitely different. This is the story of 12 soldiers who took on a defensive artillery position manned by 60 enemy soldiers. That's impressive enough. But not only did they accomplish their mission of destroying enemy artillery for 105mm guns, they did it with no real reconnaissance, no supporting fires, they were on their own. Why is this important? Well, tactically, it was executed flawlessly with no real intelligence to speak of, but it was also an operational success because taking out those guns here allowed the American 4th Infantry Division to move off beyond the beach that was being hammered by the artillery from those locations right across the way. How did it all happen? Well, the first thing that happened was the Company E, 2nd Battalion, 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment lost its company commander during the airborne operation several hours before, and so command of that company went to its executive officer, 1st Lieutenant Richard Dick Winters. After linking up with his parent unit at the hamlet of Grand Chemin on the morning of June 6, 1944, Winters was given an order with minimal guidance. There's fire along that hedgerow over there, take care of it. No briefing, no intelligence, no task organization to speak of, Winters found himself given the mission of destroying a German artillery battery. Initially the battery had been reported to consist of German light howitzers firing into the causeway of exit number two leading off Utah Beach and they threatened the 4th Infantry Division's advance inland. Other units had stumbled into this German position earlier in the morning and had been stopped by the Germans. Winters did a reconnaissance at about 8.30, but it was a very hasty one. He only knew roughly where the gun positions were, right on the other side of that hedgerow. He collected a team of 12 men from his own company and some other men as well, and they made their way towards Braycourt Manor, three miles south of Utah Beach and just north of the village of St. Marie Dumont. When they arrived, Winters and his team discovered the number six battery of the 90th Artillery Regiment consisting of four 105 millimeter howitzers, all connected by trenches and defended by a company of soldiers. Winters believed that the German unit was part of the 6th Parachute Regiment with emplaced MG42 machine guns. Think about that for just a second. Winters, 12 paratroopers were opposed by 60 German soldiers. For every one American German soldier, they would be up against five or six Germans. The German gun crew, originally signed to those four 105 millimeter guns, had apparently deserted during the night of the airborne landings. Lieutenant Colonel von Heitje, the commander of the German 6th Parachute Regiment, had observed the landings at Utah Beach. When he learned about the desertions, he drove to Carrington and he ordered his 1st Battalion to occupy and hold St. Marie Dumont, just up the road, and Braycourt, right here, and find the men to work on this artillery battery right behind that hedgerow. When the Americans arrived at the battery location, Winters finalized his plan. He'd position his two machine guns for covering fire and send several soldiers, 2nd Lieutenant Lynn Compton, Private Donald Malarkey, and Sergeant William Guineer to one flank to destroy the machine gun position with grenades and then provide covering fire. While the trenches connecting the artillery positions provided the Germans with an easy way to supply and reinforce the guns, they also proved to be their biggest weakness. After destroying the first gun position, Winters and the rest of his team used the trenches as covering approaches to attack the remaining guns in turn. Each gun was destroyed by placing a block of TNT down its barrel and using German stick grenades to set off 
the charges. Reinforcements from Company D, led by 2nd Lieutenant Ronald Spears, arrived to complete the assault on the 4th and last gun. Spears had a reputation as an excellent and extremely aggressive officer, and he led his men against that last gun position by running outside the trenches and exposing himself to enemy fire. After the four guns were disabled, Winter's team came under heavy machine gun fire from Braycourt Manor and withdrew. But Winters had discovered a German map in one of the gun positions that marked all of the locations of the German artillery and the machine gun positions throughout the entire Cotentin Peninsula. This was an incredible piece of intelligence and once Winters got back to his headquarters he passed it on through his command and they were so thrilled with it that they sent the first two tanks to reach Omaha Beach right here to this location to support the paratroopers. Winters accompanied those two tanks and directed their fire eliminating the rest of the German resistance. Four Americans were killed in the attack. Troops landing at Utah Beach had a relatively easy landing due in part to his successful assault. Colonel Robert Sink, the commander of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, recommended winners for the Medal of Honor, but the award was downgraded to the Distinguished Service Cross because there was a policy awarding only one Medal of Honor per division. In the 101st case, that was Lieutenant Colonel Robert Cole, who was also extremely deserving of the award. There's also later a campaign to upgrade Winner's Distinguished Service Cross to the Medal of Honor, but a bill to do so, H.R. 796, died in the committee at the end of the 110th United States Congress and it wasn't reintroduced. The official Army history about these events on D-Day is pretty quiet about the battle. Army historian Slam Marshall interviewed Winters about the attack, but it's believed that because the interview wasn't private and many of Winters' superiors were in the room with him, he may have downplayed everything to avoid all of the personal accolades and keep it as brief as possible. But courage, competence, extraordinary leadership, Braycourt Manor, ladies and gentlemen, a textbook infantry attack by any measure. I'm John Fenzel, and I thought you'd like to know.